Hi, I'm Sean Wildermuth. Welcome back to Coding Shorts. Today I want to talk about Markdown. And I know Markdown isn't necessarily a technology that everyone is using, but I think many of us might be using it where we don't know. Probably the most famous place it's being used right now is in GitHub. But whether you're using a tool like Obsidian that I showed a couple of videos back, or using other authoring tools out there, or whether you're using knowledge bases to write your own documentation, you're going to run into Markdown quite a bit. And so I've talked to some people and I've heard that they know kind of what Markdown does, but they can't seem to remember any syntax for the Markdown. And I'm going to do a very quick video here, Markdown in 10 minutes, might actually be five minutes, we'll see how it goes, and show you what I think you need to know without complicating it with a lot of weird stuff. Ready? Let's get started. So I'm in Visual Studio Code. You could be in Visual Studio, you could be in any of the JetBrains IDEs, you could be in a ton of different editors. Most of them support Markdown. One of the things I like here is to use their preview window. And this is just going to show you whatever I type on the left hand side, the result of the Markdown. So if I just start typing, this is a test of Markdown in general, you can see it's just text, like there's nothing magical. In fact, if we press return, we say this is another test, we'll see that we're generating Generating two different lines, but if we want a space between them, we actually have to put a space between them. So it's very much what you see is what you get. Now for doing things like bold and italics, you can just surround it with a character like double asterisks, a single one will make it italic. But of course you could just use HTML here. And that's one of the things that's interesting here is that markdown text allows you to type just HTML markup if you want. Almost everything in markup works. So you don't have to know markdown to do this. You could just write HTML if you prefer. Usually we want to do something a little easier. So let me give you another example. Let's say we want to write, please go see my blog. And I'm going to go ahead and type in my blog address. And you'll see over here in the preview, it is already a hyperlink because it recognizes that it is a link. But I don't really want my whole address here, especially if I'm doing things like refer equals coding shorts. But for links, all we have to do is surround the link with parentheses. And that's going to be where we're going. And then before it put straight braces, and then we can say my blog, whatever we want. And so this is a simplified way of dealing with simple links. Now, in a lot of cases, you might just want to put the URL there, especially if you're linking between pages or between different sites. But we can see that the syntax is very much simplified from the raw HTML. But if you've ever used Word or any other type of word processor, you're probably used to this just being paragraph text. But what if we want to have a big header here? When you do a single pound space and then a title like this is a test of markdown, you can see it's shown very big. In fact, this is kind of what you would think about as the first header, H1, if you want to think about it in HTML sense. And if we add another one, we get two, three, four, five, and six. This is like an H2 or a header two to show what we want to show on the right hand side that will end up being a header. And I like this because it mostly just reads well. This double pound sign is indicating to me that this is probably more important than the stuff down here anyway. And if we go ahead and say this is bullets, You'll see it's a bit smaller because again, it's that third level of headers. And how do we create bullets? Well, I've done this in comment sections for years when I want bullets. I just put a dash and then I start to go first, second, third. And you can see on the right hand side, it's actually making these bullet points. These become just an unordered list in this case. You can do the same thing with numbers. But in fact, these don't even need to have real numbers. What it is doing here is just saying, oh, there's a number pattern that I know. I'm going to number these sequentially. And that can be really useful when you want to go ahead and reorder these without having to fix all of the actual numbering. It'll take care of that numbering for you. And if you want to have other sorts of formatting inside of it, and so I'll just say this is 1.1. This is 1, 1.2. And in this case, you'll want to start with the second to give markup the idea that we're going to want to continue at that number. And so you can see it created a first here and then second and third just because I added two as the second element. And if I want to have sub elements, I just indent them to make this work. 1.1, 1.2, 1.3. So I'll make this 2.2 and 2.3. And so just by having that indention here, it's going to know, oh, I want to be able to do this. And so 1.2.1, 1.2.1.1, .1, 1 .1, etc. It's going to follow all of the indention to create real bullet points. Again, this reads like what we expected to read like, and therefore we can really see that writing these should become pretty second nature. 
Now what happens when you want bullet points, but we want these to actually be checkboxes? All we need to do is put a angle bracket or put a space inside of it. And you can see here, they're now checkboxes. And when we click on them, in most viewers, it'll go ahead and edit it to put an X because that's how you make it look checked or not checked. Now in places like GitHub or other knowledge bases that you might be using like Confluence, these become active. So when someone's making a list of these in their issue, for an example, you can just go to that issue and click on those and it'll actually change the markup underneath to have that check mark so that you can actually monitor them without having to edit the entire document over and over again. And so those check boxes can be really useful long-term. Because we're coders, right? A lot of this is about instruction or documentation or other things like that. When you write something like you start with a variable named hello, and if I put backslashes around it, it'll actually change it to a fixed width font and give you that background that sort of implies that it's code. It's a different way of really doing something like a bolding, but it's very specifically gonna turn it into a code snippet inside. And that can be very useful when you're writing instructions for different developments. And we can also, let's say, let's create our hello equals quote, right? That's some code, but it doesn't look like code. If we tab in twice, in other words, give it four spaces before, it'll actually turn it into a code block. And so we can take this and create a multi-line piece that you can just copy and paste if that's what people want to do. Now, you don't need to use this indention, and in fact, I rarely do. I understand why it exists. I like to be a little more explicit and use three back ticks around it and you get this same format so you know really when it begins and ends. One of the magic things here is putting a code after the first three back ticks to show what language it's in. So I can say C sharp and we'll get coloring for C sharp. If I say JS, it'll be JavaScript. If I do Python, it'll get Python formatted. Of course, the semicolons in Python aren't great, but in this way, you can really tell it what kind of syntax coloring you want. In most cases, it's gonna do the right thing. Now, the C-sharp is directly after the three ticks. If you add one, some tools, especially Confluence, won't like that there, and you'll have to put it back right before. And so this helps you figure out that what we're doing here is really pretty simple. We're talking about very few different elements. The other element that you're gonna want is, let's say I wanted to have my face here, right? And let's put some parentheses in there and just go ahead and type Wildermuth. Dot com, images, headshots, Sean YT for YouTube, JPG. We'll see that all it does is create us a link here. And if we were to open this, it would show us that image. But if we put a exclamation point before it, it'll actually bring it in as an image. Now you see this image is way too big and you could use different CSS or even some attributes by changing this to an image tag in order to size it if that's really what you want. But most tools are gonna let you resize it for itself. Even putting in images kind of makes sense in the sense that it is just a link, just like the regular link, but we're telling it it's an image because of that exclamation point. In fact, most of the tools you'll use also support drag and drop, especially GitHub. If you have a screenshot of the problem, drag and dropping it into the editor window, will create one of these with a very magical name because it has code inside that will upload it to some cloud provider, probably one of GitHub's, and then just send you back what that link would be. But if you have existing, this does not have to be absolute. You could certainly do that as well. And you'll see with this image, because it's broken, it's just showing the brokenness because this is still just an image tag under the covers. And the last couple of things I wanna show, first is a block quote. And I use these probably more than I should, but if you start with a greater than symbol and then start typing, this is a block quote. We should should have more info. I can even go ahead and put like bolding around it and then we can get a block quote that sort of looks like this. Again, depending on what tool you're using, this will display a little differently, but we can see that it has the same idea of being able to have one or more of those sort of indentions. And this is more for paragraph text than it is for like bullets as an example. And the last thing I'll show you is actually, you can also use emojis and they're using emojis by name. So if you do something like smile with colons before and after the name smile, you'll see that it turns into an emoji. None of this that I've done should force you to have to remember a ton. Only these two syntaxes may be somewhat unintuitive, but once you do a couple of them, it sort of sticks. And everything else mostly makes sense to me because if I were to write the same ideas in a text document that I wanted humans to read, you could see this is all very readable and gonna tell them the same sort of thing I would expect them to have. Does that make sense? 
So hopefully this was a really short video. And just to give you some of those tools when you're writing your own markdown. Markdown can be very powerful in the way we write knowledge bases, we write our own notes, and even write documentation and of course, source control systems where they're going to accept Markdown. You see that Markdown is used in a ton of different places. I tend to use Obsidian for my own notes, which I write in Markdown. And I also use Markdown Monster, which a friend of mine wrote. It's a commercial product, but it's really good. So if you're doing some heavy lifting with Markdown, let's say creating whole documents or whole sets of documents, that might be useful to you as well because they can do some advanced things like upload images to image services and be able to create blogs with templates. It's a really good tool. I'll leave a note in the description to that as well as a couple of other tools that all use Markdown. Make sense? So this has been a short coding short. My name is Sean Wildermuth. Thanks for watching.